you and thank you so much for uh, allowing us to be here together this morning to celebrate as a church um, Christmas. And we humbly ask, Father, that um, you will speak to us uh, through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, uh, December has finally come, diba? Right? And for a lot of us, we were surprised. Hala, December na day, diba? And of course, um, we cannot say the same for Christmas. Um, we cannot say that Christmas just snuck up or sneaks up on us, right? Because for us, a lot of, for us Filipinos, September palanggani, kibao na tanga, padong na Christmas, right? We hear the music when we go to the malls. We, we, you know, we see all the decorations. We hear about the pre-Christmas sales and all of that. And and I mean, Christmas is everywhere, as Paolo said. Christmas is here, and you couldn't miss it even if you wanted to, right? And yet, this year, as with every year, many people still miss it. I mean, we don't miss the day itself. We don't miss the event. We don't miss a Christmas party like what we have today. But we do miss the meaning, the joy, the wonder of Christmas, even for us Christians, even for us who call ourselves believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I was thinking about um, what I wanted to share to you this morning, I was just wondering, um, what was the um, tune, what was the feeling, what was the outlook of the people during the first Christmas? I guess uh, we saw something of a part of the story when we saw all of the presentations this morning, right? But by and large, the people at that time, or at least number one, they were unaware. Secondly, I think there was a sense of hopelessness. And there were people who were basically indifferent. Unaware, hopeless, indifferent. Unaware why? I, I guess except for those who, were, who played a major part in the story like Mary and Joseph and the kings and the, the wise men and, uh, you know, the parents of Joseph, uh, yeah, um, uh, John the Baptist, um, except for them. By and large, nobody expected anything on that day, right? In Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. What does Luke tell us here? He's basically just giving us the rundown of what was happening in the government, the political situation at that time, a, a decree, a census was given, or a decree was given that, that everybody should go to their home time, hometowns uh, to register. And Caesar Augustus was at the height of his power at that time. Rome was at the peak of its power as a nation, and a lot of uh, smaller nations were subject to Rome. And if you think about it, the decree sent ripples to everybody. Most especially to Joseph and Mary, right? Because Mary was with child. And so going to Bethlehem from Nazareth would not have been easy. And probably, very likely without their knowledge though, Joseph and Mary probably did not realize that what God was doing was that he was fulfilling a prophecy that was given by Micah. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. I mean, if you think about it, Nazareth was far. God had to bring Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem in order to fulfill this prophecy. But by and large, if you think about it, the population of the entire country, of the entire world at that time, they didn't expect anything. They were unaware of, of this wonderful thing that was happening 
on that first Christmas. And if we're not careful, we will be falling into the same situation as well, right? We can be very consumed with what's happening around us, what's, what, you know, how, how it's going to affect us, how, how it's going to you know, impact our lives. We're, we're thinking about the economy. We're thinking about, uh, is the dollar going to go up or go down? We're thinking about um, gasoline, rollback of gasoline. You know, is it going to affect us or not? Or maybe, just to bring it a little bit closer to home, some of us are thinking, I wonder if I'm going to get my 13th month pay, right? Maybe the company hasn't been doing really well, and I'm not sure if they're going to give us 13th month. Or maybe, are we going to receive bonus, right? And maybe if you're a business owner, you're thinking, I wonder if next year will be better, and you're looking at the sales, you're looking at you know, uh, clients, and you're thinking, I wonder how it's going to be. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Nothing wrong with, it's just that because of all these things, we suddenly become unaware. We're distracted. We're too busy looking at different directions. So that's the first thing. They were unaware. The people at that time, unaware, just like us also. They were also hopeless because that was what the Jews were dealing with on that first Christmas. Now, although the Old Testament was full of prophecies about the coming Messiah, um, generations have come and gone, right? Centuries have come and gone. No Messiah. And so even if with, with all the 300 prophecies that they found in the Old Testament, you know, time passed by and it's just easy to lose hope. I think a lot of the Jewish people at that time have lost hope. They, they, they felt defeated, most especially because they were under the yoke of the Roman people. And at that time, it was not easy. And waiting and waiting for the Messiah, you know, there's a tendency for you to just say, Wala na siguro ni, di ba? And I think some of you can recognize that because you're in a season where you've been living with a lot, a, a time of waiting. Perhaps you're, you've been waiting a long time for God to rescue you, to do something for you. And, but the longer you wait, there's nothing happening, the more hopeless you become, right? Because the truth of the matter is we don't like to wait. Amen. We don't want to wait. If you go to a restaurant, for example, to buy coffee, they give you this little gadget that will light up when your coffee is around. Diba? And so you have to wait until that thing lights up. Or if you go to a uh, bank, for instance, or a, gover a government office, they'll give you a number, right? And it, it says number 30. And then you look at this... Um, the, 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 the television or the screen says number 10. I see, I have, there's 20 more people waiting before me. And you know, you wish, it, it, life could simply be like that, diba? Right? For example, if you're waiting to be married, and you want to be married for a long time, and unfortunately, there is no deadline. There, there, is no, there is no sign, and nobody tells you, you can wait for four months, and then finally you'll get married. Or you, you're waiting for a job, and you, you, somebody tells you, you know, just wait for a year. I mean, waiting would be easier, diba, if, if it's like that. I mean, you know there's a, there's a time frame. But life doesn't happen like that, diba? You, you've, you've wanted to, uh, you've, you've been waiting for God to fix your finances. You've been waiting for God to, to fix your relationship. You've been waiting for your, your knight in shining armor. Or, or you've been waiting for God to, 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 uh, to bring some kind of justice in a situation that you're in. And for a long time, nothing has happened. That's what was, uh, and for, for the people of Jerusalem at that time, they have been waiting for this Messiah. That's why in Matthew chapter 12, uh, Matthew had to say this to them. In Matthew 12, 17 to 21, he had to quote Isaiah to remind them of what God had promised. Look at what it says. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, 
um, the one I love in whom I delight, referring to Jesus, of course. Now I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. And that statement, because uh, Matthew was talking to a Jewish audience, he was telling them, Jesus has come. You can have hope. And I believe he's talking to us as well. Amen. Jesus has come. We can have hope as well. But if you think about that time, they were unaware. There was a sense of hopelessness. There was also indifference, especially among the religious leaders. You know, um, the men read to us Matthew, uh, the story of the kings, right? When the wise men, they were not actually kings, they were wise men, they, the mag magi, they went to Herod. They came to him and asked him, where is this king of the Jews, right? Of course, Herod didn't know. He was, of course, threatened by that. So what did he do? He went to the religious leaders. Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. It says, When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, this was Herod, okay? Where is the Christ that was to be born? Verse 5. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, notice they actually quote Micah chapter 5 verse 2 here. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people. When Herod asked the religious leaders what's going to happen and where the king is going to be born, they immediately said, Bethlehem. They knew exactly what the answer was, right? Here's what Bob Deffenbo, a, uh, uh, a Bible teacher, here's what he says. He says, the chief priests and scribes of Jerusalem had no difficulty supplying Herod with the birthplace of the Messiah. That is Bethlehem. And I believe they had a very good understanding of the details concerning the coming of the Christ. But in spite of all this knowledge, they did not recognize his coming or respond properly to it. I mean, think of, about it. These religious leaders were God's representative at that time, right? They knew the truth. And if they knew about that, and if they heard about Bethlehem, why couldn't they just go and verify it, right? And if you think about it, it still happens today person can know a great deal about religion, a great deal about the Bible, but can remain insensitive and blind to it. These people had the facts. They knew their Old Testament. They knew how important the coming of the Messiah was. They had, they had been waiting for 400 years. They lived in Jerusalem where the temple was. This was where all religious activity was. What happened? Were they busy? What, with the religious activities? Were, were they busy with, with externals of their lives? Or were they just too arrogant? Or were they simply insensitive and they did not care? See, as long as Jesus is just fury, he won't mean anything to us. Right? Truth is, even today, for a lot of Christians, we can replace a genuine relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, with religious activity. Very easy to do that. I tell the interns all the time, you know, you have to take care of your relationship with God. Because if we don't, we can replace it with activity, with things to do, even religious activity. So they were unaware, they were hopeless, they were insensitive. They were indifferent. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isn't that what our times look like? A lot of people today, Christmas is here, right? But they are unaware, they are hopeless, they are indifferent. At the end of the day, Christmas passes by and we thought we celebrated Christmas. But the question is this, where is the joy of Christmas? 
Do we have that? Remember what the angel said to the shepherds. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, did you know that the Bible tells us that Jesus had a joy in him? Motivated by joy, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Look at, what, look at this. This is very interesting. It says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, mourning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, the, the Hebrew writer continues to exhort his readers and tells them, you know, consider Jesus what he endured so that you will not lose heart. Question is, what kept Jesus going? Bible tells us in Hebrews, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And the question is, what was that joy that was set before our Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, think about it. When Jesus came to this world, when he became man, what did he do? He subordinated all his desires in order to do something. And we're told the reason why he did it, because there was a joy that was set before him. But we know that. If you want to do something really, really important, it doesn't matter how difficult it is. Because at the end of the road, we're going to be very happy with the result. That's what this verse tells us. The joy that was set before our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the reason why he ran the race. Because of the joy that was set before him, that's why he endured the pain of the cross. Because of the joy that was set before him, that's why the, our Lord Jesus Christ allowed himself to be born in a manger. To be born as a lowly human being. And what was that joy? What kept him going? Was it a crown? Was it authority? Was it glory? I believe it's not that. He had all those in heaven. He had everything, everything of those. He had the glory of heaven. He had the relationship with the Father. He had, he had authority over all the earth and over all the universe. But listen to what Charles Spurgeon says. I want you to listen to this. It's a long quote, but... This is what it says. It says, the joy that was set before Jesus was principally the joy of saving you and me. I know it was the joy of fulfilling his father's will, of sitting down on his father's throne, of being made perfect through suffering. But still I know that this is the grand great motive of the Savior's suffering, the joy of saving us. It was us. The joy that was set before our Lord Jesus Christ was us. He had everything else, right? He had the Father. He had the glory. He had the authority of heaven. He had the universe. The angels were bowing before him. But he did not have a relationship with us because it was broken by our sin. And if he loved you and me just so much like that, that he would do that for us. To be born in humble means. To be a slave to death. And to be his joy. Shouldn't he be our joy as well? Amen? So this Christmas, let's ask ourselves. Is the joy of our Lord our joy as well? Now I end with this simple story. There was this um, story during the depression of, of a family. And there was this kid who found out that the circus was coming to town. And the tickets cost something like $1. But they were a poor family. And so this little boy goes to his dad and says, Dad, 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 I really want to go to the circus. You know, can you give me a dollar? And the dad says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I can't afford a dollar for you to be able to watch the circus. But here's my suggestion. Maybe you can work or you, you can do some part-time job and, and, and try to earn a little bit of money 
and then I'll give you the rest. And so the boy did that. He, he worked hard through the summer and he, 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 you know, he mowed the lawn, he, he did babysitting, all of that. And finally, the circus came to town and his dad gave him just enough for him to buy that ticket. And so he was so thrilled, right? The day the circus came, he, he, he went and bought the ticket. He grabbed his ticket, rushed to the main street where there the, the, the parade came. And he was so thrilled when the parade came through the main street. He saw all the clowns, all the elephants, all, all, all the performers. And he was looking at it with, with, you know, with awe. And a clown came by, danced around him, and, and the boy took his ticket and put it on the clown's hand. And he eagerly watched the rest of, parade, of the parade go by. And after the parade went, he, go, he went home. He told his dad, 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 I saw, I saw the circus. It was so great. But the dad was, was surprised. How come you're home so early? Tell me, what did you see? And the young boy told the dad, you know, the parade went down the main street, you know, and the clown and all of those performers, this, this clown that came, I gave him my ticket. And the father told the little boy, you know, son, you did not see the circus. You just saw the parade. And you know what? That little boy reminds us of what many people do on Christmas Day during this season. We get so caught up with the carols, the celebrations, with the trees, the lights, with the eatings, with the gifts. And we think we have experienced Christmas, right? But really, what happened is that we just saw the parade and missed the main event through joy of Christmas. Thus, the true joy of Christmas, Jesus Christ himself. Amen? So don't let Christmas sneak up on you here. Don't be unaware. Don't be hopeless. Don't be indifferent. Because the joy of Christmas here, Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time that we can be here. to Just be simply reminded of what our, our true joy holds on. And it's the joy of Jesus Christ himself. Today, as we celebrate with one another, as we have fellowship with each other, may we be reminded that everything that we do here today is not for ourselves, is not to have fun, although all of these things are wonderful gifts from you, but to be reminded that everything that we do, the reason why we can celebrate is because Jesus has come and that he is our source of joy. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a big clap offering. I'd like to ask the worship team to come and lead us to a final song. Let's all stand up from our seats.